those of you who have been here for a number of years have heard, heard Dr. Gene Get speak. Um, this man has planted over 300 churches around the world. Uh, he has written more books than I think I have ever read before. Uh, he retired almost 10 years ago, and in retirement, spent seven years of that writing a study Bible that is one of the most unique study Bibles. You've all heard about that, the, the Life Central Study Bibles with QR codes in it. Um, back in the 70s, he wrote a, uh, a book called The Measure of the Man. Um, that has never gone out of print. Today, it's still in print. We're just recently, this last year, it was rewritten, updating it, bringing uh, QR codes into it. Um, so, amazing career. At, and we usually don't talk about somebody's age, but at 85 years old, uh, Gene Getz is still going so strong. I'm a, I, I have the honor, the privilege of serving on his board. Every month, we sit down and we go through his travel schedule that's coming up during the next month. I look at it and go, I'm hoping that when I'm 60, I can keep up with that type of travel schedule. <laughs> so, ladies and ge or gentlemen, <laughs> Dr. Gene Getz. Well, thank you very much, Bob. It's really a pleasure to be with you and uh, to share. And uh, Bob asked me to somewhat pick up, am I okay? I'm getting a big echo. Can you hear me out there? I'm doing okay? Okay, I'll just ignore my echo. <clears throat> Bob asked me really to pick up with where I left off last time and uh, some of the qualities uh, that we've developed within uh, the book, The Measure of a Man. Uh, just to uh, set the stage once again, um, uh, when I was teaching back in the seminary in 19, late 19, uh, 60s, early 70s, uh, the Vietnam era, I uh, was challenged in relationship to the relevancy of the church, wrote a book I never planned to write at that time, which was sharpening the focus of the church, uh, which was in print for about 25 years, but that book led me to start a church I never planned to start, which was the First Fellowship Bible Church, which led me then to become a pastor something I'd never planned to do after being a professor for 20 years, 13 years at Moody and seven years full-time at Dallas Seminary. A group of people interested in the concepts that we developed said, hey, would you help us start a church? So we started the First Fellowship Bible Church, which, thank God, has expanded to about 12 churches just in the Metroplex uh, here. Uh, Tony Evans was our first full-time church planting pastor. We paid his salary for three years to start Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, which, by the way, was a great investment in the kingdom. And uh, so God chose to just spread it around the world, literally, uh, in terms of these churches. Most of them came just developed spontaneously. But as a pastor, I knew that if the church is going to be strong, I had to have strong men. Strong men who loved their wives, loved their families, were effective leaders in the church, men who were great witnesses in the business world. And so I just invited a group of guys to show up one Thursday morning to study the Word, and about 25 guys showed up. And then I had to make the decision, what are we going to study? And I feel the Lord led me to the 20 qualities that are outlined in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Uh, Timothy was in Ephesus <clears throat> working with the church there, uh, dealing with some issues, and uh, Titus was in Crete. They had just established churches. And in both of those letters, Paul outlined qualities of maturity. And uh, when you put those two lists together, you have about 20 if you eliminate the overlap. So I said to the guys, I said, hey, why don't we take one of these a week and uh, study it? What does it mean from Scripture, and then how can we apply it? And so we began the process, a 20-week process. I led the first uh, quality that we looked at, namely having a good reputation, looked at the Scriptures with the guys, then we spent about 30 minutes just talking about how can we develop a good reputation. And then I just opened it up and said, guys, uh, how about uh, 
I need volunteers for next week, next week, next week. And so I said, I've modeled it for you. You do the same thing. And I just faded into the group as uh, though I was the lead pastor. I just became a part of the process as we shared the leadership. Well, to be honest, it was one of the most dynamic Bible studies that I've ever been in. I began to journal. And we were about six weeks into the process, and I was uh, in my office, and a friend of mine from California, Bill Gregg Jr., who's now with Jesus, stopped by, and he had heard about the church that we had started, the First Fellowship Church, and he said, Gene, I just, uh, I just want to find out what's going on. And I said, well, Bill, here's one thing I'm doing with these guys. And I said, I'm journaling. And I opened up the notebook and showed it to him what I'd been journaling on each of these qualities. He looked at it for just a few minutes. I don't think even a few minutes. He just looked at it and said, Gene, I want this as a book. Would you write a book on these 20 qualities? And he had his acquisition editor with him. And he turned to Dave, his name was, and he said, Dave, do you have a contract? And uh, Dave said, yeah, he pulled it out of his briefcase and he handed it to me. By the way, that's a writer's dream. That doesn't happen too often. He said, I'd like you to sign this contract because I'd love to have it as a book. I said, well, Bill, I'll certainly pray about it. I did, and the Lord led me then to write the book, The Measure of a Man. Now, I didn't realize how God was going to use it because, as Bob says, it's never gone out of print. Now, calculate that for a moment, it was first published in 1974. So from 1974 to our year today uh, makes it over, what, 40 years that it's never gone out of print, which is very unusual. But I often say uh, it's not because I wrote it, it's because I borrowed the outline from the Apostle Paul. (laughs) Do you know where he got it? directly from the Lord. What I was able to do, the privilege that I had, the opportunity I had, was to take those 20 qualities revealed by the Holy Spirit as the measure of a man, the qualities of spiritual leadership, what we ought to be as men. The Holy Spirit gave those to Paul, who shared them with Timothy and Titus, and today we have it in our scriptures, the inspired word of God, And I simply brought it first into the 20th century, now into the 21st. I didn't realize it would be translated into many, many languages and used literally around the world. And why is that true? Because these qualities were revealed by the Holy Spirit and they're supracultural. This is what a man of God should be becoming any place in the world at any moment in history. It doesn't matter where we are because... These 20 qualities, I believe, is what it means to measure up to the stature of the fullness of Christ, as Paul says we should. It's a reflection of Jesus. And the fact is, we'll be in process until he takes us home. This is not a one-time experience where you all of a sudden become what Paul outlined in 1 Timothy and Titus. It's a lifetime experience. Process And every time I go through these, and I've gone through them many, many times, particularly in preparing men for leadership. And I always have to take, it my, take a look at my life and see an area where I need to give attention in order to grow in that particular area of my life. Now, that's how it came into existence, and I'm so thankful that, uh, that God is using it the way he is. But to God be the glory. Because when I wrote it, I never never had any idea that that would happen. And the most recent uh, opportunity I've had, Baker bought out Regal Books, and then they said, Gene, we want you to uh, revisit the book one more time. And I have revised it a few times. And and that I did, and it just came out uh, not too long ago in this new format, The Measure of a man. And I'm just really excited with the way God is using it and the feedback that I'm getting it, getting as I travel across the country. In fact, I was just in Memphis on the weekend with a group of guys who are working through it. And 
uh, just to see how God is changing people, changing men's lives. The exciting thing to me as well is men, Bob, in your area, era that really uh, got a copy of this book way back when they were in, in college and uh, now older. <laughs> and, and they'll come up and say, I've been in a conference somewhere. They'll say, Gene, that was the first book I read after I became a Christian in college, and it changed my life. It is changing my life. I just wanted to say thank you. So uh, it is very rewarding, and, uh, and again, it's awesome, it's humbling, and uh, I just thank God for the privilege. Now, in terms of review, what I thought to do this morning is a couple things. One is just give you the profile with comment. The last time I was here, I took you somewhat into depth in a few of these, but I'd like to just uh, review the 20 quickly with a comment just to show you the profile. Now, keep in mind when Paul wrote these, he was saying, Timothy, Titus, if anyone's going to be a spiritual leader, here's what he ought to look like. Here's how he ought to behave. This is what he should be as a man. Now, when he said that, he wasn't saying these qualities are only for leaders. By the way, if you're a father, you're a leader. If you're a husband, you're a leader. If you don't have a business, you're a leader. Wherever you are, you're a leader. But Paul was talking about spiritual leaders in the church, but he wasn't saying these are qualities only for leaders in the church. These are qualities for every man who wants to be like Jesus Christ at whatever level of leadership we are. Because this is what makes not just a great, significant, qualified pastor or elder, but this is what makes a good father and husband, and businessman. So Paul just simply said, first of all, in both passages, we're to be above reproach, and that doesn't mean perfect, it just simply means we have a good reputation. Who doesn't want a good reputation? Scripture says a lot about it. And in each chapter, we take a look at what these qualities mean from the Scripture. A good reputation simply means that people speak well of us. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. By the way, one of the greatest ways to build a good reputation is when you make a mistake is to say, I blew it, I'm sorry, forgive me. You trust people who admit they're wrong. I'm sure you've met people who will not admit they're wrong. Everybody knows they're wrong, but they won't admit it. That doesn't develop a good reputation. I was talking with a wife this week, and she was sharing about her husband, and she said he will never, ever admit that he's made a mistake. However, we know he's trying to say, I'm sorry, but he can't say it. He's just trying to change his behavior a little bit to show that he's sorry, but he can't say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Kind of sad, isn't it? His wife is longing to hear him say, I'm sorry. It'd be a lot easier. The fact of the matter is, we're all in process. We build our reputation. When we make mistakes, we admit them, we go forward and correct those, those situations. I'm meeting with a man on Monday who requested to meet with me. And I happen to know this guy from another part of the the United States who's made some serious mistakes and created a lot of hurt in people's lives. And I reached out to him months ago and never responded. He responded this week and he wants to meet. He's here in Dallas. And I'm just anxious to hear what he's gonna say. I have no clue. Uh, I'm hoping he will come and say, Gene, I made a big mistake in my life and I, I want to correct it. It wasn't against me, it was against somebody else. A good reputation. Well, quickly, the husband of one wife or a man of one woman simply means moral purity. Moral purity. And I've learned over the years, and I'm sure you have too, if you can't trust a man morally, you can't trust him. 
when Clinton looked into that camera and said, I did not have sex with that woman. I knew he was lying through his teeth. I've seen that again and again. And he was lying, admitted it later. But what about trial from that point forward? He got caught. Was he truly sorry? Well, only God knows his heart. But the fact is, if you can't trust a man morally, you can't trust him. And that's what Paul's talking about. We're to be above reproach morally. Do we make mistakes? Of course we do. And again, it's coming to the cross and dealing with the issues in our lives. And we experience forgiveness, move forward. Prudent means wise, or temperate means balanced in words and actions. It just simply means we're walking a steady life, alert, keeping our eyes on Jesus, not diverting from the path. So it's a lifetime process being temperate. Prudent means wise and humble. Not thinking ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Now, God wants us to feel good about ourselves, but he doesn't want us to be arrogant. That's prudence. You can find a passage of scripture for every one of these qualities, and that's what we did in going through them. Respectable, I love that. Cosmios is the Greek word, and we get our English word cosmetics from cosmios which simply means that our lives are to adorn the gospel of Jesus. The verb uh, cosmeo to adorn, is translated adorn. And that you see how that relates to cosmetics. So the word picture is that when people look at our lives, we're like cosmetics to the gospel. It makes the gospel what? Attractive. And that's respectability. Isn't that great? That's a lifetime goal, right? You can take that to the bank in so many ways in terms of life, respectability. Hospitable means unselfish, generous. Able to teach is not ability to get up and use words in a way that move people deeply. What able to teach means that in the context of communication, we're gentle and patient and kind and we respond to people in a non-argumentative way. You look at the context of it, it's a beautiful picture of what it means to be able to teach. Uh, kind of summarize it in Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. That's what it's talking about. Not addicted to wine, but simply means not addicted. And you can generalize that. We're not to be addicted to any substance. By the way, have you seen the reports on cocaine? How many people are dying every day? It's unbelievable. This website where they can get drugs. For, is it cocaine or? Opium. Opium, yeah, yeah. For five bucks or something that people are, I don't know, 300 people a day or something are dying. I wasn't listening carefully, but I may have those numbers wrong, but it's incredible. Addiction. We're not to be addicted to anything. Not self-willed. Simply means not self-centered. Not a controlling personality. I was ministering with a guy who was a veterinarian just on this weekend in Memphis. I've known him for a long time. And he was such a control guy that he put his in a psychiatric ward and she was absolutely catatonic. The marvelous story is, and he, he reiterated it again for me this weekend, Jane, I was there in that hospital room and she couldn't communicate and I looked up and the television was on and I heard Dr. Adrian Rogers, who had a church at that time in Memphis, he's with the Lord, looking right at me and dealing with my issues. And he said, I got on my knees right there in that hospital bed, accepted Jesus Christ and realized what a control freak I was. And the marvelous story is that woman is as healthy as any woman I've met today. She recovered from her psychosis. 
It's a marvelous story. But, but I, he was, if he were a day, he'd say, I was a control freak of control freaks and dominating and controlling them. Beautiful woman today, Charlie. I know her well. Big smile on her face when we chat. Not quick-tempered, void of anger. And not all anger sin. The Bible says be angry and don't sin. There's a study. There's a study for you. How to be angry and not sin. Not pugnacious. Well, that's anger out of control. We know that's sin. That means abusive. That's the next quality that comes after not quick-tempered. And then, by contrast, gentle, sensitive, loving, kind. That's a great study. By the way, that's a, that's a unique word in gentleness. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I, in that chapter, uh, I used Tom Landry as an illustration because I think that Tom, as I read the stories of his life, you don't think of him as necessarily a gentleman, but when you look at the Greek word for gentle and what it means in terms of really caring about people, and, and there's a lot of illustrations of how he cared about some of those guys. How he, he didn't show it outwardly, behind the scenes. Boy, he really, really reached out to guys like Dee Dee Lewis, for example, who became a, an alcoholic. I had the privilege, by the way, of ministering to Dee Dee after a horrible failure in marriage and business. In fact, I use him as an illustration in this book, but... Tom was really concerned about Dee Dee and the direction he was going. It's, it's a form of gentleness that you just, you don't see on the surface. There are several words that he used. Peaceable, which simply means non-argumentative and non-divisive. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. And I have the opportunity to, uh, to meet with this guy on Monday who's been out of harmony with another brother, a pastor. And when I had the opportunity, when he wrote back to me after months of delay and said, I'd, I'd like to meet with you, I'm hoping that I can be a peacemaker in this relationship. In fact, the pastor texted me this morning knowing I was going to meet with him, and he said, Gene, I haven't been able to sleep about the fact that you're going to meet with him. I don't know what's going on. In other words, he's feeling, probably the pastor feels like he's going to be attacked or something. I wrote back this morning and I said to this pastor, I just simply reminded him of Philippians 4, 6, and 7, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Uh, let your requests be made known to God and the, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. God wants us to be peacemakers. Free from the love of money. Doesn't mean free from money, thank God. Free from the love of money. I thank God for believers who are committed, who have money, to spare. Because that is so great in terms of building the kingdom. God designed it that way, but he doesn't want us to love it. Manage your own household well. There's a lifetime task. <laughs> We've all been in that process. The times I remember I had to sit down to my own kids and say, forgive me. I blew it. When I had to sit down with my son and say, son, if I had things to do over again, I'd spend more time with you. I allowed the ministry in some respects to get my attention more than you. And, and by the way, that was a, a neat little breakthrough with him. Uh, I remember I learned something from my son Kenton. He was, uh, for a period of time, he was a ski racer up in uh, Colorado, a very good racer on a racing team. And I took a month off just to be up there with him, and I said, Kenton, you know, uh, when you're in high school, I missed all those football games because I was preaching on Friday night. I said, wow, I said, I'd just like to make it up to you 
I'm, I'm going to be up here with you for a month just to be with you. You know what he said to me? He said, Dad, you can't make it up. Just be here. And I thought, boom. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and he was right. You can't make it up. What meant to him the most was, you're here. Be here now. And that was a neat time and a great insight for me. Loving what is good, pursuing godly activities, being just, that means wise, discerning, non-prejudiced, and fair. Being just. Devout. That's another word for holy. Devoted to God is a great uh, translation. And then self-controlled, which is... Uh, that can also be translated discipline, being a disciplined individual with our time and with our talents and with our treasures. Now, that's an overview. But in the um, redo of this book, uh, since some of you are familiar with the Life Essential Study Bible, where I have included 1,500 QR codes from Genesis to Revelation, where you can access 1,500 videos where I teach all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, which makes it unique. Uh, I also, when I redid this for Baker, I thought, wow, why don't I put a QR code at the beginning of every chapter, at the end of every chapter, to introduce the reader to the chapter, and then at the end of the chapter to talk to a group of guys to apply that principle. So in this one, there are 42 QR codes and 42 principles that are built into the book. Just to give you an example of that, let me just take you to uh, the, in the introductory video. And what you'd simply do is take your, uh, your phone and use any QR reader. I like scan. And just scan that QR code. And what will basically come up will be a video where I'll introduce you as the reader to that chapter, which I just woke up this morning and thought, why don't I take the chapter on anger, which is kind of related to most of us, being angry and not sin. And so I talk to the reader, I try to motivate you to get into the chapter. Now there's a video at the end of that chapter where I say, I talk to a group and say, here's ideas for applying what you've just studied, but here, here's an idea of what it looks like if you go to uh, that video at the beginning of that particular chapter where we're not to be angry or quick-tempered, and here it is. As I was preparing this video presentation, I read a very thought-provoking article entitled, Controlling Anger Before It Controls You. I like that title, Controlling Anger Before It Controls You. And the opening sentence in the article is certainly accurate. It simply reads, We all know what anger is, and we've all felt it, whether as a fleeting annoyance or as full-fledged rage. The next paragraph, probably written from a secular point of view, also grabbed my attention. Anger is a completely normal, usually healthy, human emotion. But when it gets out of control and turns destructive, it can lead to problems. Problems at work, in your personal relationships, and in the overall quality of your life. And it can make you feel as though you're at the mercy of an unpredictable and powerful emotion. To be honest, I don't think I can really improve on those comments. Though this article was published by the American Psychological Association, the content correlates very well with what we read in the Bible. For example, there's the story of Jesus who became angry when he confronted the money changers in the temple in Jerusalem. Tables and coins were flying everywhere. There's the intense argument between Paul and Barnabas regarding John Mark, and the Greek word Luke used in recording this event indicates it was a very intense situation. And let's not forget that jealous rage that led Cain to kill Abel, an intense emotion that has led to horrible homicides throughout history. 
As I read more of this article, I, I couldn't have agreed more with some of the practical suggestions for controlling anger. In fact, some were in perfect alignment with Scripture, such as what they call cognitive restructuring, which simply means changing the way we think. In fact, in this chapter I've called Handling Anger Appropriately, I've shared some proverbs that really support the suggestions in this article for anger management. Here they are. He who is slow to anger has great understanding. He who restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. Let me share a personal story that relates to the truth in these Proverbs. I received a telephone call one Sunday after church. A young man on the other end of the line was livid. He verbally attacked the professors at the seminary where I taught. He was angry at the spiritual leaders of my own church, and he was angry at me. Now, no question, bad things were definitely happening in this young man's life, and he blamed us for the loss of his job, as well as his family problems. To be honest, I was getting angrier by the second. But then, as my emotions were really beginning to churn, I began to ask myself some questions. What is really bothering this young man? Why is he being so vulnerable? After all, he was really opening himself up to serious rejection. As I thought about the answers to these questions, I actually began to regain my own emotional composure. I could feel it beginning to happen. I was able to listen more objectively and respond with concern rather than my own anger and to calmly suggest that we really needed to get together and talk. Almost instantly, I sensed his own anger beginning to dissipate. In retrospect, I experienced the truth in another proverb, Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Well, we met, and he shared the true story. He was really angry at himself, and at his wife particularly. His world was falling apart. He had lost his job, but primarily because of his own mistakes. At that point, I was able to gently remind him that if he had been honest with me in the first place, it would have been much easier for both of us. I'll never forget his response. He smiled sheepishly, literally through tears, and said, I know, but I want to thank you for loving me enough to tell me what is wrong with me. Well, I've shared this story simply to illustrate what the secularists might call cognitive restructuring. First, on my part, in controlling my own anger, I was able to help this young man control his own anger, to help him start thinking more clearly about the cause of his own problem. The Proverbs call it discretion, knowledge, understanding. But let me say one more thing. Though there is some great truth in this article by the American Psychological Association, there's a very important omission when it comes to a biblical point of view is the concept of sin. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 26, said this, Be angry, and yet do not sin. This simply means that there is anger that is not sinful. But there is anger that is sinful. What does this really mean? Well, hopefully you'll find answers in this chapter I've entitled, Handling Anger Appropriately. And once you've read it and discussed this God-created capacity with other men, I'm confident you'll discover some very practical ways, as Paul said, to be angry and yet do not sin. So what I've uh, done with each of these chapters is to do an introductory chapter where I try not to repeat what is in the chapter, but broaden it and set the stage 
And uh, then, as I said, as I go into the chapter, then at the end of the chapter, I come back and I say, okay, now let's talk about how to apply this, how to work with it, and I do a brief one. This one, by the way, is a little longer than normal. Uh, usually they run about five minutes, just boom, to get you into the chapter, and then about five minutes at the end to, to get a group in, into it. And the exciting thing for me is the feedback that I'm getting is that this really helps, and, it, and some guys have said, Gene, it's like you're sitting there with us helping us. Kind of takes me back to the experience I had way back when in the 70s when I wrote the book. But I've, I had a couple of stories that I, I wanted to share with you, that, and I, these stories just keep coming in. Uh, but one of the fascinating stories was related to, um, uh, Jim Dobson called me and uh, interviewed me, wanted to interview me on this new edition. And so I went to Colorado Springs and he spent two programs on the, the talking about the, this new edition, The Measure of a Man. And um, it's really exciting. And, and by the way, let me just simply say, you remember when, you, when you'd get a DVD set to go with the book where you'd have 42 videos? You know what you paid for it? probably $200. These are free. You buy the book and they're all there, 42 videos. Anyway, it's kind of neat what technology is able to do for us in relationship. But anyway, Jim was interviewing me. Well, unknown to me, there was a former chief of police that was listening on the radio. I came back to Dallas, the phone rang. It was Larry Hesser. Larry, what? was uh, at one time chief of police, Henderson, North Carolina. And he said, Jane, I contacted you in the early 80s. I said, really? I was chief of police in Hendersonville. I asked you if you would do a code of ethics based on the measure of man. He said, somebody gave me a copy of the measure of man way back in the early 80s, and I read it in one sitting and said, man, this is what I need, and this, is a, this could be a code of conduct when I hire police officers. I can't hold them accountable, but I can say, someday you'll be held accountable for how you do your job. And he said, I asked you to do a code of ethics. And I said, did I do it? <laughs> he said, you did, you did it. And I said, and then it, my memory started coming back. And he, I said, well, send it to me. Well, he not only sent it to me, but uh, since he now lives in this area as a retired police officer, he brought to my office what he had framed and put up in his office in Hendersonville. And this was the adaptation as a code of conduct that I wrote with my name at the bottom. I had forgotten that I had read it, written it, but I went and I told him, I said, you know, I don't anything, know anything about being a police officer, but he said, well, I don't know anything about what you do, but could you do it? And I went back and read this, not just, I just, just happened a couple months ago, and I thought, wow, that's good. <laughs> But the exciting thing is that he had this in his office and he would give out the measure of a man as he was hiring police officers and he's been doing that for years. What's the QR codes? Now he has the QR codes, right. QR codes didn't exist back then. But anyway, um, that was really exciting and the other exciting thing is he's now introduced me to um, another officer he was chief of police in Palestine, Texas. We've been meeting. Bob, you've met them. Two guys that have a vision for police officers. And, and by the way, they're also using the Life Essential Study Bible. And their vision is, and, and they talk about police officers, the problems they face, the suicides among police officers that's way above the norm because of all the stress they're facing and all the problems they're facing. And their vision is to somehow get them into the Life Essential Study Bible, those who are Christians, 
and into the measure of a man to help them to do their job. There are over 700,000 officers. So we're brainstorming with them. How can we help reach police officers? But what an encouraging thing that was to me, something that happened in the 80s, forgot all about it. It's still active, it's still going on, and now taking on life of its own because these two guys have a vision in terms of reaching police officers uh, throughout the United States. Another story that really encouraged me. I got this uh, email. Uh, this, this happened, uh, it's dated February this year. And it came in really third person because it was written to our website. Never met this guy before, but he said, I am a business leader in Dallas-Fort Worth, particularly a highway construction company. I am wanted, I've wanted to share a word of encouragement to Gene Getz. The leaders of our company all have a copy of the Life Essential Study Bible that we all go through daily it has changed a lot of folks and the way we do business. I'd like to shake his hand or have breakfast. Just let me know. I want to say thank you. Well, he left his phone number, and I called Russell Lindsay. And I was quite amazed because he's involved not just in one company, uh, which is an asphalt company, where in Dallas, Texas today, he's redoing roads with his company but across the United States, but he's part of a conglomerate uh, company called Southland Holdings, where there's five companies, and these guys are all in cahoots, these vice presidents, and they are all using the Life Essential Study Bible and the measure of a man in their company. And so Russell shared with me, I'd recommend, he said, I get a copy of the Life Essentials Bible for all of my managers. Now, he said, I'm looking for men to begin with as managers, and he said, asphalt business is tough. This is a rough bunch of guys. But he says, at the top, we want to demonstrate what it means to be a man of God and to work with these guys out on the roads and show them what it means to be someone who is following Jesus Christ. And he said, I give a copy of the Life Essentials Bible to all of my managers. And by the way, in the whole company, they have about 1,500 employees. And then he said, I also have put all of these qualities. Now, I just found this out a couple weeks ago. I put all of these qualities that I just went over today on a plaque and I give them to every one of my managers. And in the conversation, he said, Gene, we've just moved into a brand new office building downtown Dallas. And he said, I was watching my managers. And he has about 11 managers. And he said, the first thing they put up on their wall was this plaque before they set up their computers and everything else. And I thought, wow. Thank the Lord. I'm sure you can realize this is very encouraging. <laughs> now, after all these years, something I wrote in the early 70s is still impacting men today. Not because I wrote it, but because it's God's profile. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. You guys made it all the way through. Congratulations. I'm Corey Huddleston with Wingman Ministries, and I want to welcome you guys, and thank you for taking the time to watch the video. If you enjoyed it, please give our speaker some love by hitting the like button just right below me right now. If it's your first time to visit the Wingman channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner. You guys have a great week. We'll talk to you next time.